Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burks and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. The videotaping today is sponsored by the Historic Preservation Fund of the U.S. Department of the Interior through the Nebraska State Historical Society and the City of Lincoln, a certified local government. Our speaker today is Ed Zimmer. Ed has been the Historic Preservation Planner for the Lincoln Planning Department for 30 years. He also has been a member of the Lincoln School Board for 19 years. Ed is a native of Omaha and spent a decade studying and working in Boston, earning a PhD in American Studies from Boston University in 1984. While in Massachusetts, he freelanced as a researcher and writer for clients, including the Peabody Museum of, at Harvard University, Lowell National Historical Park, and the Smithsonian's Museum of American History. Um, Ed's talk today is titled, Haymarket Old and New. Please join me in welcoming Ed Zimmer. Thank you, Eileen. This will be kind of on the order of an update on some of the events and changes in Haymarket. And it will not only cover the old, but also try to get to some of the new. And I will be talking probably about a wider area of Haymarket than I have in the past, because I think as some of these projects have occurred, we might go up as far as S Street um, and um, maybe reach a little farther uh, south and west as well. But we have to begin at the beginning. And in the original plat of Lincoln, a market square was set aside between 9th and 10th and O and P streets. And then quite quickly was given over to the federal government in, to encourage them to come and build a post office and courthouse in Lincoln. And so what we would call government square on the original plan was market square. And in a way, that was the beginning of uh, the Haymarket notion and function in Lincoln, or at least the name to a degree. The market function moved two blocks north to what had been laid out originally as the Library and Historical Society block. And that's the one where Journal Star distribution and printing plant is today. But this is how it looked um, looking Northwest across that block and the tall building in the background is the um, Missouri Pacific um, Depot on the north end of Haymarket, uh, now long, long gone to the uh, I-180 uh, highway. But we're looking across, and it literally was a market square, there, or it was a Haymarket, there was hay scale, and you can see farmers having brought their um, hay and wagons into that square uh, to be weighed and sold. Um, at what was the original Hay Market. Now to get to what we call Hay Market, we could look to the 1867 plan of the city, um, and you can't see much there. It looks like a waffle, but that's, it was a pure grid city. Um, everything was north, south, east, west. But where the um, legend is up on the upper, or the inscription on the upper left, a plat of Lincoln, the capital of Nebraska, uh, that cuts down to O Street on the south and on the east side to 7th. So there's a chunk missing, and that chunk would be much of what we would call Haymarket today, was not even sketched on to the original plan. But it rather quickly was added by a little um, partial plan that was drawn and was appended to uh, the original plan, and the large square of that says, b and M R R Depot Grounds. In 1870, Burlington and Missouri River Railroad uh, entered the city of Lincoln, the first railroad to come to the city, and a large section was laid out, the equivalent of six square blocks as the rail yard, um, and a bunch of phantom blocks and lots were laid out over what would have been just swampy uh, floodplain. Um, those streets never existed. You can see a little bit of where the creek is drawn meandering through um, that section. And probably that floodplain and the creek were some of the key reasons the railroad came in to that uh, side of town because it was nice flat ground. You weren't dealing with a lot of grade. You dealt with, with water, um, many springs, but um, 
apparently, I've been told it was rather dry for several years before 1867. They may not have known how much water they would be dealing with. But that's when we start to put on the map uh, the area that we would uh, come to know as Haymarket and uh, particularly the um, kind of arena grounds of West Haymarket uh, redevelopment. With the railroad coming to Lincoln, uh, we also started um, seeing both these big land sales. Uh, the railroads received grants of land uh, for every mile they laid out across Nebraska. Um, and then they also set about trying to sell that land to immigrants. And this is one of the posters that Burlington Missouri River Railroad had prepared. Um, it has the name of um, George Harris, land commissioner at the bottom. Mr. Harris is of the Harris House and Harris Overpass family in Lincoln, so that will make a connection to some of what I'll show a little bit later. Now at the very bottom of this poster, it tells you that there were free rooms available for buyers to board themselves at both Burlington and at Lincoln. And that building on the left in this view with all the chimneys and particularly with the gables in the roof was where you could get your free rooms um, in the early 1870s um, if you were traveling from Europe to Nebraska to buy some of that railroad ground. Uh, the building at the end of the boardwalk, and this view would have been taken from a high point at about O Street, um, not on the O Street overpass because it didn't exist yet, um, but they're on something high. Maybe uh, there were some boarding houses on the south side of O um, at about 6th Street, and it's looking north, northwest, across the low swampy grounds that was that depot grounds and the little wooden buildings that were out in uh, the rail, what would now be the rail yard or the West Haymarket area today. The immigrant home, which is what the uh, boarding house was called that has the gables, um, was about where the District Energy Commission plant is um, in West Haymarket today, and so, or maybe under the gravel parking lot in front of that. Um, we went looking for that archaeologically. Rail yards aren't a great place for archaeology because they churn up that ground time and time again and build rails and put tanks in the ground and all kinds of things, and we couldn't find anything clear and distinct um, of those very early buildings. We have a woodcut of that immigrant home, um, which gives us a little closer look at its architecture and uh, how high it sat, and then there's some steps down from the platform um, to get down to, to grade level beside it. The little wooden depot out in the yard was replaced in 1880 with what we would call a high Victorian Gothic depot, sitting just where Lincoln Station or the um, Burlington, uh, what would have been the CB&Q depot originally in 1927, sits today. So this sat um, actually on the 7th Street right of way um, at um, P Street. Um, and this is the south side on the right. Um, and the west side on the left facing across the tracks. Lots of tracks, no platform or no, no canopies covering the uh, tracks yet. Um, we're looking at the rail side. So if you're in the parking lot south of the depot today, that'd be about the angle you would have um, on this building if it were still there. But it was replaced in 1927, of course. Uh, this just a Quick look at one of the flood days, I think this is early 1900, this might have been the flood of 1908, um, which was pretty catastrophic. By then, the first overpass had been built, so there's now a high vantage point uh, to record that rail yard. And we see on the far right edge, the 1880 depot, and to the left, right about the center of the view, that immigrant home was still standing, but out in now a busy, crowded rail yard uh, with all these lumber and coal sheds, and it was being used just as a storehouse. Um, but it did survive into the 20th century um, out amid all that activity in the very damp rail yard. This is one of the great bird's eye views. There were four done in Lincoln in the 1880s. The city was growing so fast there were enough new buildings that I think you could sell a new version every couple of years to have your building on the plan. 
um, but three of them look from this northwest point um, looking southeast across the city. About at the top center is Government Square, uh, Old City Hall. And so what we would know as, a, as Haymarket would be from the rail yard and the depot um, up into 7th and 8th Street, O to um, R, uh, or S streets. This is the only one of the bird's eye views that shifted the point of view, and this is a detail grabbed from it, um, that was more a um, west-southwest position um, looking across the city. And there's the depot again at the far left. And I wa just wanted to show a few of the buildings from 1889, uh, date of this view, are still standing. Um, and we would call the oldest of them lead bellies um, at 8th and Q. That was the Seton and Lee um, Iron Works. Um, just to the east, its neighbor that we might call the Tool House um, on the northeast corner of 8th and Q uh, is also a late 1880s building. The Veith Building um, on P Street. And then um, not showing as well here because we don't get the face of the buildings, but on the right, a couple of the warehouses at 8th and O, um, old grocery wholesale houses. And uh, up at the top center, we're seeing the back side of the Murr and Burr, Burr and Muir block, uh, which stands just north of the gas station south of Berries on 9th Street. So that is the collection of Haymarket buildings that date all the way back uh, to the 1880s. Now I'll go from some of the oldest buildings with new projects to some of the newest projects and some projects that aren't even uh, quite realized yet. Um, so beginning with the oldest building, the uh, Seton and Lee Foundry, uh, 8th and Q, um, which produced architectural ironwork, um, both heavy things like the mill and elevator equipment, um, but all the way down to iron fittings and particularly cast iron storefronts. Um, and they had, their home office was in Atchison, they also had a branch in Topeka, and on that card identified that um, one block from the new Burlington and Missouri River Depot in Lincoln, Nebraska was the third of their plants, um, which we would now recognize as lead bellies. Didn't stay at Ironworks very long, um, just through the 1880s, um, by the early 20th century, and you can see they've painted a, a founding date of a company, not of the building, 1906. Um, this is when um, Carter uh, Moving and Storage was using the building and the associated um, foundry buildings north of it. Obviously, those have been replaced, but the corner building still remains. Um, later, it's Sullivan transfer in the same building, and Sullivan had built the big five-story warehouse next to it. And then finally was Norm Buck's moving in storage. Um, when the building had faded, it had always been painted. It's a very, very soft brick. And presumably it had been painted brick red. Red doesn't stand up very long in sunlight. And it was a pink building um, by the mid-1980s. But it still retained both through the paint, you could read at that time, above that um, ornate window, it says office, just as it had in that 1906 view. Um, but particularly of interest to me in this view, both the sill uh, on the east side of the first two floors and the lintel above the first floor are cast iron. So those are products of probably not this building itself, probably shipped up from Kansas, but those would be the kind of work that Seton and Lee did, among others. That building has been many different names of restaurants. We want it now to stay lead bellies for a long, long time. But if you wanted to have a trivia game on restaurant names, um, you could use this building from La Paloma to Brazen Head to Bachami, 8th Street Ironworks, Magnolia, and Capital City Grill before the owners um, and their tenants um, conceived of it as a new thoroughly renovated building, um, both um, structurally preserved um, and presented in a new manner 
Um, those canopies set to either side of it were carefully designed to be freestanding. They don't hang on that soft brick. They support themselves um, out on the right-of-way. And even the sign itself stands on that um, leased ground of the right-of-way so that it's not hanging off that soft brick building. Um, but it's great to see it um, back in good shape again um, with still the um, freight windows in the center of the east side preserved um, as large blank openings because those were where the freight doors were. Above it you can see where the crane the beam would have stuck out with a pulley on it for hauling things up to those freight windows. Just across the street, as I mentioned, is um, the old tool house building, but initially that was a cracker factory. Um, Jones, Douglas, and company were cracker bakers, um, and this is a very early view of it as a cracker manufactory. Uh, from the early 20th century, for more than a century, it remained um, a hardware warehouse or associated um, businesses in its last, often called Hinkle and Joyce, in its last years called the Tool House, and when they specialized in, um, I guess, every possible fastening you could buy uh, were stored carefully and cataloged in bins throughout the building, and they'd also expanded into the building east of it. You can read hardware um, painted on that long vertical on the um, west wall. Just above it, I have to mention the building they expanded into um, in this 1931 view, Hankel and Joyce had already um, built up to and added on, extended themselves to include 1818 Q Street. And this looks pretty familiar today, but if we go back to the drawing for it, in 1915 the elevation looks familiar, but in 1907 it doesn't look familiar at all. This is a building that's been maybe as thoroughly transformed as anyone in town. It was built as a two-story building um, that is its south elevation, its Q Street elevation on the upper portion there. Um, Woods and Cordner designed that. What made it most notable was not just that in 1915 it got a whole new face and a third floor, but it was one of the first reinforced concrete buildings in Lincoln. And in 19, end of 1906, beginning of 1907, there's a newspaper account saying this is the first large reinforced concrete building in Lincoln which gave it the structure that you could put another floor on top of it um, seven years later, um, and also that you could completely change the front, just put a new front on the building. It was holding itself up from everything except that front wall, and lots of new openings weren't any trouble in a heavy reinforced concrete building. So Woods and Cordner got credit for one of the first con reinforced concrete buildings in Lincoln. The new facade that we recognize today was the work of C.H. Larson. That's a building that's being transformed quite radically, um, both the, the old corner building and the moving and storage building next to it. Um, as they cleaned the brick where it said hardware on the left, just in the cleaning process, it was revealed that it earlier had said crackers. Same number of letters and a few of them overlap, or maybe crackware, um, but that's that same sign, but just with a little bit of the um, paint has chipped away and we can read what it used to say. Um, this was the Speedway Properties concept of how they might add um, exterior seating um, to the buildings for restaurant use on the lower floors. Their intention on the upper floors and what they're building out now are what they call micro lofts, um, which I think is a name for a small studio apartment that sounds better than a small studio apartment. Um, <coughs> with some additions on top to um, add uh, space within the footprint, and that's what's being uh, constructed today. Just north of that on 8th Street was an old moving and storage warehouse also associated with the Sullivan firm. Um, this was their old building. It was completely remodeled when um, Star Newspaper stored their newsprint in that for years and then was remodeled again into an antique mall and really retained nothing of its early character. Um, so the Preservation Commission um, accepted a proposal to demolish uh, that much reworked building and on that site and attached to the back of the tool house structure, um, build a new hotel. 
Uh, this is the Hilton Garden Hotel, uh, or Hilton Garden Inn, um, that stands now on the site of that old warehouse and a portion of the back of the Hinkle and Joyce site. Just north of that, um, beyond the north zoned boundary of Haymarket, but I think we, talking about a neighborhood, would use Haymarket more broadly than the zoning lines on the map. Um, and just north of the Hilton is the Marriott Courtyard, um, replacing another much remodeled warehouse that really didn't retain historic character, which is why the historic district didn't extend across that line. Um, and that's been carried out, I think, very faithfully to the original design. It has a handsome canopy uh, standing out along the street for the drop-off zone, which is somewhat reminiscent of the canopies, the glass-roofed canopies on the depot um, down at 7th and P. Um, and I think a building that does a nice job of having a modern face away from Haymarket and a nice traditional brick face uh, on the Haymarket side. It also connects us up beyond the official Haymarket line up to a building that I think we can very comfortably claim, uh, the old central planing, which originally was a threshing company. There were lots of um, farm implement dealers in Haymarket and the original use of that building that we now call the sawmill for its long um, ownership by the uh, Hoppy Lumber. Um, and that's where Bread and Cup and Office Space, uh, Bar Vermeer and Hacker Architects are up in a portion of that building. And so I think we can extend our neighborhood understanding of Haymarket, certainly, uh, to go up as far as uh, Lumber Works, or Sawmill Building and Bread and Cup. And they've put up a sign to remind us of that, so. Down to the south end of the district, and continuing some of the very earliest buildings, um, one of the finest grocery warehouses um, of the early period in Haymarket is originally Hargraves Brothers um, building, a three-story structure of 1884 um, up on the uh, original parapet. You can see on one little gable it says 18, and on the other one it says 84. Um, so that was the original construction date. There were entrances on the O Street frontage, um, two entrances uh, we can see under the Hargrave Brothers sign. Um, here the building is all dressed up in a photograph of probably um, 18, late 1880s, early 1890s, um, and it includes beside it, with the banner across the front, Cool Fresh Beer, um, Occidental Saloon, which today and for many years past has been the Fringe and Tassel costume shop, um, it's that little space. And that saloon particularly served the building to the uh, west of that, which was had many names, but the first name was St. Charles Hotel. Uh, so that was the lounge beside that old hotel. Hargraves became, um, well, before it became Schwartz Paper Company, I have to burn the roof off in 1905 and rebuild the roof with an additional story. And so where we had seen a three-story building, we now have a four-story building. And that happened um, during the grocery wholesale days in 1905. Schwartz Paper then uh, took over the building in the teens and has been continuously occupying it for almost a century. They've now um, struck a deal to have a new warehouse built uh, down by Southwest High School. They will move out and uh, on the back, where there's that little one-story, very plain wing, a four-story addition will be built, and the building will be converted to offices um, below and three floors of apartments above. Um, and so we'll see some of the Haymarket development, which really is represented principally by Fringe and Tassel on the, um, at least on the west side of 8th Street, um, below, south of O, um, now we'll have a uh, significant new anchor down to extend the development um, into the Har um, Hargrave Schwartz Paper Building. And where that old storefront existed, there still is the original fine ironwork, and not just the ironwork, if you look to either side of that former entrance, which will be restored as an entrance, the air conditioners will come out and the stucco will come out and that'll become um, an O Street door again, to either side of that is the old storefront glass and wooden structural system. So this is a 
surviving 1884 storefront, and it will be restored as part of this uh, renovation project that's about to begin. Uh, this is the center pier of that uh, facade, and down at the base, it says Seton and Lee, Atchison, Kansas. I like to think that that means the mold that already said Atchison, Kansas, was shipped up and cast at 8th and Q. One piece of ironwork on this remnant of St. Charles Hotel, just to the west of this, still does say Seton and Lee, Lincoln, Nebraska. And if you look in your small town storefronts around the state, particularly a place like Red Cloud, almost all the storefronts there say Seton and Lee, Lincoln, Nebraska. So those would have come out of Lead Bellies. None of them say Lead Bellies, Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> Just a couple quick uh, shots inside uh, Schwartz paper. It is remarkably unchanged. Well, some of the changes are remarkable as well as as, as what hasn't been changed. On the first and second floor, um, in the paper company days, mezzanines were inserted very lightly. They kind of float there. It's not real apparent what holds them up, but the tall stories were split in half, um, and this one um, is so minimal, especially under the beams, that it says on the beams, duck or die. Um, this was not, and it's not space that they've used for years, um, but you can see both the uh, wooden posts and some of the big cast iron posts that are part of the structure of the interior of this building. And those go from the basement um, up to um, and at least through the first and second floors. That's a little lighter construction where it was rebuilt above that. And here we see, um, I think this is the third floor um, and um, some of the um, current use of the building. Very clean, very very bright interior. Uh, there will be some new windows very carefully added on the second floor particularly where the existing window sill within an opening that looks like it should have a large window um, has only a small window at the top at about the nine foot level. So nobody can stand and look out that window um, and they would have permission to add a row of windows within what looks like an original window opening down lower so that it'll be much more pleasant uh, residential property. On the west end of that same block, uh, in an area that was originally, or was for many years, uh, a parking lot on a former lumber yard, so they called it the Lumber Works parking lot, there now is the Lumber Works parking garage. Um, and that was built um, looking rather raw on the west and south sides because it's going to have a building largely wrapping around it. Um, and on uh, the west side particularly, filling that um, canopy street, the new street, frontage from O down to N, uh, this is the building that's, that's planned. This would be a senior um, housing building, both um, assisted living and independent apartments um, on that block. That portion at the center that kind of swells out incorporates the stair tower of the parking garage, the elevator and stair tower of the parking garage today, and provides an, a, a way to connect the floors around that existing structure. Uh, but this is in the planning stages today. They have um, preliminary approvals. They have some way to go in negotiating their specific redevelopment agreement with the city. Um, but this would be a type of housing we haven't built new downtown maybe ever. There are certainly senior housing projects downtown. The Housing Authority has the old Clayton House they call um, Crossroads um, at 10th and O, um, but this will be a new purpose-built senior housing project um, in Haymarket with great west views. We still, we build the next buildings just west of it. Um, and right in proximity with that, um, if I'm going to go old to new in Haymarket, I should touch on the original viaduct of the 1880s, um, a cast iron and, and uh, steel and wood structure. And we're looking under it here. Um, the depot is right under, in the mist, is right under the streetcar. Um, and on the right side through the uh, legs, we see the building we would call the creamery um, at 7th and P. 
Uh, here's a look at that um, viaduct as it still stood in the 1940s. And this one particularly makes clear it didn't come down and meet ground at 9th and O, it met ground at 8th and O. So it, it had a much steeper rise there um, and then went over the rail yard from 8th and O, which is why we have that collection of very large buildings. Three of the corners at 8th and O are four and five story warehouses. That was the entry point into town until the 1950s when the new Harris overpass was built and extended all the way to 9th and O. So that became the new entry corner of town flying past by a block what had been the old um, entry corner. Underneath that old viaduct were the um, Watson Bricks and Lumber Yard um, on the south side. And then the depot was rebuilt um, in 1959, in 2009. Um, cleaner, simpler structure, cleaner particularly in that this has a ceiling on it. And if you're a pigeon, you can go look for a nesting spot over the rail yard, but you can't look for a nesting spot over um, haymarket activity. And it is much cleaner and brighter underneath for that. Um, one of the buildings that benefits, one of the pro property locations that benefits by um, the new overpass uh, is an early 20th century single story building at 700 O Street. Uh, we had a lot of hearings about that in the last year, towards the end of, of last year. Um, owners of this property um, made a presentation to Preservation Commission that um, they couldn't financially rehabilitate this building as very low headroom, um, and they made a request to tear it down. By our um, historic district procedures, if they're turned down by the commission, which they were, uh, they cannot proceed with demolition um, until they've cleared a waiting period of six months. Um, that clock is ticking today. The commission also re received and reviewed a presentation for the proposed replacement building, which would be this one, and they approved the replacement, which is not inconsistent. Those are two separate decisions. One is, is it okay if we tear it down? And within their authority, to the extent of their authority, they said, no, we wish you wouldn't. But if you do, this is not a bad replacement. Um, and it is designed to recall the features on the other end of the block of the Granger Brother Warehouse. And actually, there's a series of buildings that relate quite closely. Um, and they clearly were looking at their context and their neighborhood. So they, um, if they clear the demolition period without changing their mind, um, they do have approval for that specific building. Another project that is beginning to move forward um, is not so much this building, which is the creamery at um, 7th and P Streets, but if you look at the west wall of that on the left hand, the east wall on the left hand side, you see um, in that wall, which is largely blank today, there were windows even on the first story um, before Ann Burkholder's building was built beside it. Um, now that's a narrow alley between the big uh, four stories of the Creamery building and two stories of the old Woods Brothers office building uh, and Burkholder's art building. And down that alley, Anne, for some years, has been putting up uh, commissioning and hanging on the wall, on the alley wall, work of some of her favorite artists. Um, and also lots of stars painted by children, who also are among her favorite artists. Um, and particularly featured the work of one of her um, studio artists, uh, Mary Kolar. Um, and this is a new Mary Kolar mask that Anne has hung up in the last year um, along the alley side uh, to accompany some of the earlier um, enhancements that, that have been hung in that alley. We're now calling this Gallery Alley. Um, it will connect the heart of Haymarket at 7th and P, or at least one of the hearts of Haymarket at 7th and P, um, to that new parking garage structure south of O. It's been a favorite alley for um, engagement pictures, senior pictures particularly. There's often glitter in that alley if you walk through it. Um, the city has been working and has finished the north half to enhance the walking surface and particularly the drainage. There no longer will be a skating pond in this alley. Now that there's a skating pond at the rail yard, there won't be one in the alley anymore. Um, 
new lighting will be added and the artwork that Anne has been adding to the wall uh, will be um, expanded to some of the other um, areas as well. And the lighting scheme being designed by a California lighting designer and artist named Patrick, Patrick Quigley will emphasize the alley character. Um, he walks through the alley and, and raves about the symphony of wires um, overhead, which can't afford to take out anyway. Um, so he's going to light them up and string new festoons of, of light and make it a bright um, and cheerful and attractive alley at night as well as by day. So it'll have artwork, which also will be spotlit, um, that you will see at night and have a special nighttime character along with the daytime character. So this will be emphasized as a pedestrian connection from that garage. And one of the entrances, pedestrian entrances to the garage is right parallel to the end, or on, in focus at the end of the alley, up to all of the bright lights and events and services up at um, 7th and P Street. And if we walked that alley and came out at 7th and P, we'd look north um, and we'd see kind of a cloud. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way. I like clouds. But there's a silver cloud uh, that you can see just to the left um, over um, beside the depot. We'll, we'll make our way up there before we finish the old and new. And, and that, of course, is um, that big building next to the post office. Uh, the plan was adopted in 2010 for West Hay Market rail yard uh, redevelopment uh, with the, the new um, shared city university arena uh, immediately adjacent to the post office. And connecting the new area to the west and the traditional historic Hay Market to the east um, is a key historic feature. Um, you can see um, this is an actual not my photograph, um, but a photograph um, recently of the historic in the foreground, the new development in the background, and linking them is the historic railroad canopy. That canopy structure dates back to about 1905 in its beginnings and first was attached to the 1880 depot. Um, we see elements of today's canopy uh, in the foreground of this view attached to the early depot. When today's 1927 depot was built, we call Lincoln Station, the blueprints included the diagrams for the structures for the new canopy that would be freestanding out on a platform between tracks two and three. Track one is the track right against the building. <coughs> track two and three would be flanking the freestanding platform. And this drawing um, in the inscription says, detail of old canopy posts to be removed by CV and Q Railroad at Havelock Shops. So they're taking down that old canopy and drawing detail of new canopy posts, same size and scale, not exactly the same detailing, but the same feature, and they combine the two of them on that freestanding platform. Um, when it's um, when it stood continuous from O Street up to above R, you were walking under new canopy for about 800 feet, and then old canopy taken down and relocated from 1905 um, for the north portion of that long continuous canopy. And until you started thinking about it, you couldn't tell one from the other. That You can from the drawings, and when you look at how they're assembled, they are visibly different. Um, and we kept, when we rebuilt, refurbished and rebuilt the canopy, the new parts south, the older uh, material, about 22 years older, um, is north. All the way back to Mayor Roland Ludke's day, um, there was discussion of how to preserve that fine feature of the canopy. Um, not sure who the gentleman is he's speaking to, but they both look good in their early 1980s suits. <laughs> they're standing next to one of the little head houses to the tunnels, the subways that came under tracks one and two and then up a staircase so you could get safely out to that freestanding platform when there were trains on the first two tracks. Um, there were two of those little structures. Um, Canopy was in pretty sad shape. Uh, in fact, uh, we've been trying for years to find a way 
to renovate it rather than lose it because the roof was rotting, the steel was rusting, uh, it was all covered with flaking lead paint. That has all been um, remediated, replaced, and put back on the same location all the way from O up to Q. There's now a break for Q Street and then from Q to R, um, providing a covered walkway all along that new street, which is the hinge literally between the old district and the new, is that uh, lovely covered sidewalk uh, representing the old platform. There's just enough canopy left to put it in front of the new housing building south of N Street as well. Um, and so it'll be the front yard feature and connect all the way from N up to R Street. Um, looking up Canopy Street um, on the west side of the canopy, and this is 1927 posts. Over in, um, under the attached canopy on the station itself, tracks one and two have now been cleared because there's a street over there and they've put in a little park space in that former track one and two location. And that also is at the two ends of it, a rain garden to absorb some of the runoff from um, the canopy and the depot building. In those two structures that were refurbished, you can no longer take the tunnel underneath, but the structures were put back up and at the bottom of their windows facing each other we put in two historic images um, so that when you're between those two head houses, the lower windows give you this postcard, which is this postcard, which features the old canopy. It's pretty much buried among the trains, but it's there. And that earliest view into the rail yard is on the south of the two um, staircase buildings. And if we look from it, we see the oldest building and one of the newest. This is um, Olson Engineering's building at P, on the south side of P at Canopy, um, one of the newest buildings in the new development area. That's what was for some years called Project Oscar, which was its code name, um, and it stood for Olson. So I think we can call it the Olson building now because no one goes to Oscar Engineering. Um, beside it, between P and Q, this rather blank building will all disappear. It has now a garage wrapping the west side of it. One of the few, the, the only um, remaining large development tract north of O Street um, is this kind of half block which will hide the um, east side of this building. And it's just fine to hide it because it is the boiler house for the whole area. It is the district energy plant um, and is meant to be wrapped in the other buildings. This is where um, heating and cooling for the new structures and for the arena come out of this central district energy plant building. It's a subsidiary uh, attached to um, LES, um, what we call the DEC, District Energy Corporation. Um, so that's the gravel parking lot, which maybe is about the location of those little wooden buildings in that earliest view. Uh, could have been about there. And on the north side is um, Hyatt Place, the, the third new hotel in the district, which is a, bit, a mixed um, building that has retail space below, hotel in the middle, and then the top floor is apartments and condominiums. Uh, I think they call the apartments Hobson Place. Um, this is looking west down Q Street and off in the background um, was Rail Yard. Now looking west down Q Street, there's a new terminus, and that terminus is the new Amtrak station. Quite a bit smaller. This would be our fourth Haymarket Depot, not even counting the, um, the one to the north. We had the little wooden one of the 1870s, 1880s, 1927, still standing. And this is the new Amtrak station um, down at Pinnacle Bank Arena Drive and Q Street. Um, a small building, but I think nicely finished, nicely detailed um, as a train depot in a dignified city ought to be. And so they, they gave it um, some polish uh, for the little, uh, little building it is down at the end of the street. And on the south side of it, two posts of the old canopy were set aside and create a little bike parking area. Um, so we've got the bike loops underneath and 
canopy cover on top of it. When the N Street protected bike path is built on the south side of N Street, all the way over Manlope Valley, through downtown, it will curve and basically come up to this location, N Street curving into Arena Drive. Arena Drive is railroad and Amtrak station to one side and parking to the other. Um, and to help people keep them straight, they are parking garages one, two, and three, or if you prefer, red, green, and blue. So here's, here's green and blue, two and three. And here we're looking between one, the red one, and green, two on the right, looking back towards Haymarket because we have to find our way back over to Canopy Street and there at the corner um, is the rail yard building, um, a mixed use building, but principally um, entertainment uses, including the rail yard itself, which is the Nebraska's first entertainment district where all of the proprietors of liquor licenses in that district have their necks on the same line. Um, you get your wristband, you can carry your beer from one place to another, which sounds like a backyard barbecue, um, but they all carefully are responsible for the safe uh, operation of that together, and it seems to be going well. Um, and it has the biggest TV, or what is formerly the Cube, um, a big uh, computerized display screen for sports, events, and video art displays um, on that space. In summer, in winter, not yesterday, when I wanted to take a picture to show you the ice skaters, but they were all smarter than I was and they weren't out in the cold. Mm -hmm. um, it was really cold. My camera decided that, that batteries and that kind of wind chill do not get along well. Um, but there weren't any ice skaters to photograph anyway. But this is where they put up the ice skating rink in the winter. And on a nice winter afternoon, children get out of cars all over the district with ice skates over their shoulders. And it's really cute when they come skate around, but even just walking with ice skates on their shoulders, I think is a, a nice urban enhancement. Um, and the rail yard does a nice job, I think, of architecturally, of being very frankly modern to the west side, towards the arena and the new development, and much more traditional in its materials and its appearance to the east side towards traditional Haymarket. And it deliberately was designed knowing it had really two contexts. And I should mention part of that context in Haymarket Old and New because there's a big building up at the northwest corner of things. And that is, of course, the new Pinnacle Bank Arena, now a little over a year old um, and seeming off to a very good start um, as Lincoln's new entertainment and sports performance place. That's what I brought you about Haymarket Old and New. And if you have questions, I would try to answer them. Carol? Did you have uh, any input into the design of the arena? It's very modern looking. Did you kind of shudder a little bit when you saw those designs and maybe hope for something that might be a little more traditional looking? Now, the question was whether um, I had an input into the design of the arena and whether I shuddered at its appearance. Um, I staff three design commissions, and the Capital Environs, not the Capital Environs, the Historic Preservation Commission that oversees Haymarket, and the Urban Design Committee that advises on um, civic architecture and civic projects that imp impact urban design, worked together in reviewing West Haymarket designs. One of the guiding principles that was adopted pretty early was we should attempt in the West development to be compatible with Haymarket, but not imitative. And particularly in the arena, it's a building form that there really isn't um, early precedent or precedent in an area like Haymarket. It's not that there aren't very big early buildings. There's a Roman Colosseum. Um, but um, there really wasn't a, a form of a traditional building um, that um, likely would be suitable for the particular form of a arena, especially uh, if you weren't going to put the, the arena in a big expensive box, you were going to let it express sort of its circular forms. Uh, so it was reviewed um, by um, urban design and historic preservation. 
The other buildings you'll notice are more kind of blended, modern and traditional, um, but the determination on the arena was that it ought to look like of its age. It also is in a location that I think was very well chosen um, at the corner of the kind of the far edge, the north end of the development area, right next to the post office, also a very non-traditional or I think ar architecturally what's called brutalism without even being insulting. Um, and, and so the determination was that it, it, was in the, it was the right design for the place it was sitting. I also like, therefore, the rail yard kind of sitting in front of it. I'm, I get comments sometimes of why, why is the view of the arena blocked from Haymarket? And my thought is, because that's a good idea. <laughs> it's not that you can't see it, and you certainly know where it is. Um, you don't hide a 120-foot silver dish, um, but it isn't the dominating element from within the traditional part of the district, and that was pretty carefully done, but it certainly has a very bold appearance coming in on 180 or viewed from R Street. So it has tried to do, hopefully, um, had our arena and our Haymarket too, and that they're, they're successful neighbors. John. Well, back to the old train depot, Lincoln Station. Yes. There were two tunnels underneath tracks two and three. Are either of those still left? Now, John's question is about the old subways or tunnels that um, went from the lower level of Lincoln Station under tracks one and two and came up on the platform into those little head houses between two and three. I think they may have some cabling that still exists, um, but they've essentially um, taken out those tunnel structures. So they're, they're not accessible and they're not, um, they've been closed off for quite a few years. Um, and as I understand it now, they're, they're pretty much not there. Um, the platform, what was the platform, which was very deteriorated, um, was crumbling concrete covered with black top, now is that new sidewalk um, as that was laid in fresh. So I think the tunnel structures are gone away. At the earliest time, there was a, one continuation that went from that freestanding platform out under tracks one, two, under three and four to come up to a very small platform between four and five. Um, that was there in the earliest photos and was gone quite early as well. That would have been for heavy, heavy passenger traffic days. Bill. To the east of the uh, District Energy building, there's this big vacant lot. You didn't say anything at all about what the plan is for the, using that. Uh, and I, I suspect that you know something. <laughs> um, Bill Avery suspected that I know something <laughs> about the what's called Block 2 in the West Haymarket parlance. Um, block 1 is the one immediately adjacent to the arena, and Block 2 is that district energy block. Um, there, are, there are plans the, um, in, in early stages of development, there are plans. The um, developers who did the rail yard and um, the Hyatt and the Arena Lofts building, student housing building, um, just immediately south of the arena, have first um, dibs on bringing forward a project. Um, they call themselves Lincoln Traction Partners, or um, LT, LTP, um, a play on Lincoln Traction, which was the streetcar company in early Lincoln. Um, and they are working on plans for development on that block, probably would come in in a series of a north building and then a south building, as um, has been the case on the block north of that. Um, but they're not far enough along yet that we've um, seen final plans or that they've negotiated an agreement. They're working on that block. That pro could be the next block we see developed or the one immediately south of the overpass. I'm getting the, we're getting towards the end of our time. Uh, I appreciate you coming out. I hope I met your needs and expectations, and I think we'll have the opportunity for Haymarket, old and new, for some time to come. Thank you.